Hi, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. My name is Ashley Lewis. I am from Axion Venture Lab, a leading fintech for financial inclusion focused seed stage fund, and I lead our investment activities across Africa. I will be your moderator today for this session on Africa's emerging fintech economies. And so I know that you've been kind of around the world today um, across a number of markets, and now we are in Africa for this session. And we're going to be discussing how the top emerging fintechs in Africa are expanding access to financial services, enabling more consumers to engage in local and international economies, and how they're staying nimble in these challenging times. And so I have a very fantastic panel that is going to be joining me today, um, and they are joining right now. And we're going to actually just kick right into the session um, and go right into some questions, but also give the panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves and their organizations. And so, Charles, why don't we start with you? Um, the question that I have for you is if you could please give us an overview of how digital finance, the digital finance market has evolved in Africa since you launched InterSwitch in 2002. So being one of the pioneers in fin tech in the region would love your perspective on that and maybe you can also share a bit about yourself and what inner switch does all right good good morning and good afternoon everyone my name is charles Fedi. i'm one of the founders of interswitch so interswitch started in 2002 initially in nigeria but is in several african countries today when i joined interswitch at the beginning i was responsible for sales business development product management software development for over 10 years then I went on to lead the consumer business, which is called QuickTeller. Then I founded the card business called Verve to basically issue a card to consumers that were mid and lower down the value chain when it comes to financial access. So prior to 2002, we almost had no payment infrastructure in Nigeria that was online real time. And back then, back then we had no a very very little visa very little mastercard very little amex in the market and even where they existed um they had zip zap machines if anyone even knows what that is now um there was very little external investment very little vc play in fact there was almost no vc investment in africa at the time and i would say that we have significantly leapfrogged from where we are then to where we are now that we even have leading systems leading infrastructure that is best in class around the world and greater than several things in other markets that we currently have. Great, thank you for that background. And and how does this kind of um, landscape play across the region? Because it's a very dynamic region um, with some intricacies. So do you have any insights on, on how digital financial acceptance has evolved across the region? Okay, so the, the, the market has evolved. Um, there, were, there are like 10 leading big markets in Africa, and everyone tends to focus on those 10 big markets, whether it's the, the players, on, on the players, the global players, whether it's the local players, because they have the existing infrastructure, they have the population, they have um, several things that actually are going for them. And then we also have several languages in Africa. So, we, I mean, that's something that a lot of Americans don't know. Well, they probably do know, but lots of people speak English, they speak French, they speak Portuguese, and then there are several local languages as well. So in expanding in those markets, you see clusters of people expanding in the English speaking sectors and the Portuguese speaking sectors less in the French speaking sectors as well. So I would say the, the it, each sector has grown slightly differently. I, I mean, when it comes to things like mobile money, for example, they have dominated in the English speaking parts of Africa. When it comes to the kinds of businesses that I, I mean, my business has done, we also focus a lot more on the English speaking part of Africa because that is where, where we are. But when you see global players, they, they focus on all parts of, of the market or they also select certain parts of the country that they, of the continent that they focus on. Great, thank you so much, Charles, for that. So um, really painting the, the picture for us. Shivani, I'm actually gonna go to you. So, you know, you run Tala, you founded Tala, and, and 
Tala has opened access to credit for consumers in Kenya, but you're also operating in other emerging markets. Um, can you highlight for us the path to how the path to scale has been different in Africa for you compared to some of the other markets that you operate in? And what makes you excited about the future and continuing to operate in this region or expand within Africa? Um, that's a great question because I, I actually really think kind of similar to what Charles is saying, uh, there's a lot more infrastructure in some ways and digital literacy in the region in Africa uh, versus other markets. And I mean, I think sometimes we tend to think, you know, a market like Mexico may be more developed, but it's actually not true. Um, and what I mean by that is actually that it's not only looking at kind of digital literacy or kind of mobile um, mobile infrastructure, but it's actually kind of thinking of financial services as again, we have to solve from the systemic issues. Um, and so some of those issues are actually things like national IDs don't exist across multiple, like many countries, um, right? So most markets actually don't have a national ID system, which makes it again, very challenging for a financial institution to verify identity um, or to be able to control for fraud. The second piece is like even from a compliance or regulatory market, you know, uh, standpoint, you have to do KYC. Um, again, in a place like Kenya, you can actually piggyback off of the national ID system as well as the SIM card, right? So again, as a kind of startup or company coming in looking to be able to deploy their product quickly and test and then be able to get to scale, for us, Kenya was the perfect market because of that. Um, that entire supply chain of what a financial institution requires was actually built out for us. And we were then able to say, okay, we can leverage the national ID system, KYC. We had the ability to transact with our customers just by integrating with the mobile wallet and PESA. And then from there, we could actually do digital collections very seamlessly and then really focus on the value proposition and the product. In a market like the Philippines, which was our second market, um, I think we went in actually pretty naively thinking that there's more digital literacy. There's actually, again, more use of social media, English speaking, all of these things, but the underlying infrastructure of payments, um, IDs, even the nascent regulatory system around digital credit, all of those things didn't exist. And so in some ways, what it did for us is challenged us to actually then become a part of developing that system. And so now we have kind of one of the most interoperable payment systems for our credit product um, across our different markets. And we've had to actually kind of think of how do we do facial recognition in the app? How do we do automated KYC? All of those kinds of things. Um, so in the end, it ended up allowing us to scale faster, but it definitely was very different market to market. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that, you know, in terms of scaling across different regions, it does ultimately come down to the customer trust. And so again, when you have a market like Kenya or Nigeria, where you start to see digital literacy increasing very quickly, the customer already trusts the product and you can focus on really developing that quality. But in a market like the Philippines, India, other places where it doesn't exist, you do actually have to double down first on that really kind of that main trust factor to get them into um, your wallet or your product. Um, and so I don't want to kind of, uh, you know, say or dismiss the issues around things outside of mobile infrastructure, as well as kind of the emotional side of money. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And just for our listeners who might not be familiar with Tala, do you mind just explaining very quickly what it is that you guys do and if your products differ across the markets that you operate in or is it a, a, a kind of standardized product? Sure. Um, so Tala is um, an Android application and it allows us uh, to instantly be able to create a credit score for our customers um, without any previous financial identity using both their mobile data, um, their transaction data, as well as behavioral data. Um, from there, Tala acts as both a lender and now also a financial services provider, providing our customers with um, instant credit access. So. Uh, again, very much like a digital credit card or working capital. Uh, and then in addition to that, we now offer across different regions, um, products around insurance, um, credit card products, debit card products, as well as savings products. 
Great. Thank you so much. And right now it sounds like only operating in Kenya within this region or do you, are you already in multiple markets or interested in, in um, operating in multiple markets in, across Africa? Um, always interested. Uh, right now we're primarily in Kenya. Um, and then outside of Africa, we are in the Philippines, Mexico and India. Great. Thanks so much, Shivani. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to actually head uh, back to Nigeria and beyond. But with you, uh, GB, it would be great to hear from you how you're seeing the payment space in Africa evolve and what new products and categories are developing for you and your team um, and where you're excited to see Flutterwave compete and obviously what you guys do for the listeners. Thanks so much. My name is GB. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Flutterwave. Flutterwave is a payment technology company that helps um, African businesses accept payment in Africa. We're present at the moment in over 15 countries in Africa. We've been around for the past four years. Um, looking at Africa, right? Um, Africa has really evolved in payment from the picture that Charles painted. Um, that was where the early days, right? <laughs> you know, it's really amazing how much work they have done um, in the switch and the Charles' char team at that point you know, in building the base, basic infrastructure for African payment. What we have done further with the past four years is to build on that and basically, you know, build what we call an African-wide payment system, right? One thing about Africa is Africa payments are extremely advanced in every market. If you go to Kenya, for example, M-Pesa is a pretty solid payment system and it works well in Kenya. Nigeria, the VEF card is pretty much a staple product in everybody's hand in Nigeria. If you go to Ghana, MT mobile money works well. But what you don't see is one single infrastructure that connects all these payment systems together, which you see in the West, right? Your MasterCard works well anywhere in Europe or in America. Unlike here where, you know, M-Pesa doesn't work in Nigeria, you know, VevCard previously wasn't working elsewhere, but now it is thanks to Vev, Vev Global. But the point is, we were trying to build an infrastructure that connects everything together and makes it easy for a small business, a large corporate, an enterprise or a global merchant to accept via one API any kind of payment from Africa, right? And in the past four years, we've been able to do that for the likes of Uber, Netflix, you know, Microsoft, and basically build that infrastructure that makes it simple and easy to accept any kind of payment in Africa. And Africa has evolved since then, right? Um, like Shivani mentioned, it's, the literacy for digital payment is only on, is, is extremely high, right? And you'd be surprised about how, how everyone basically, you know, is involved in that. In Nigeria, for example, you've got the NIP payment system, which is the, the interbank payment system, which is a huge, huge payment infrastructure that does billions of dollars, right, across board because of that literacy and access to payment. Of course, financial inclusion is still a big piece of Africa, right? Because some people are still not included, but, we, we, but that's not because of lack of technical payment infrastructure. It's due to lack of, you know, resources that are still scaling across the, the, continent, the continent. Yeah, that's basically um, how I see that. But yes, the goal and what we've seen so far is Africa is here to play really hard on digital payment. And like Charles mentioned, payments in Africa, in Nigeria specifically, has been real time since donkey years ago, right? Um, real time payments available in Nigeria, you know, and that really is driving the payment landscape. Thank you, GB. And so my big takeaways from what you guys have already said is in consumer interest is there, um, the scale opportunity is there. Literacy is climbing, but infrastructure is still challenging. And so you're either on the side of you are addressing the infrastructure issue um, or building on top of that. And so, and I think from some of my research, something like 56% of ventures in Africa right now are um, dominated by the lending space or the payment space. And so that I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, now I have some broader questions for the entire group. So let's start on this conversation around partnerships. So in this region, I'd love to hear from you, what is the power of partnerships in expanding financial inclusion and financial service access? And what are some examples that you've seen work in your businesses when it comes to collaboration um, and working with outside partners, either across the continent or internationally? Okay, let me let me go first. 
Uh, one of the products InterSwitch has is a product called QuickTeller, and it was it is a P two P instant P two P bill payment funds transfer platform that makes it possible to do things on on the web at an ATM point of sale and the mobile app instantly. Basically, all of these services. So when you speak about financial inclusion, it means that only those that are more or less mid to more affluent have access to those services. So the kinds of partnerships we will do will be partnerships with people that have agent networks. So agent networks are people that have last mile access to the more remote locations. And these people that deal at this last mile only deal with cash. So how do you partner with people that have access to this last mile people to, let, to provide them those exact same services? So one of the partnerships that, I mean, InterSuite did years ago and still continues even till today is partnership with those kinds of agent networks that have access to those um, last mile people and make it possible to perform electronic transactions, but now using cash. So that's, that's one particular example that I can give of how to reach the last mile and to at attain more financial inclusion where um, network infrastructure may not be available or where do they don't have access to real time services or the devices to actually perform those kinds of services. That's great, Charles. And I actually have a follow up question on that because sure. I'd be curious to hear from you. What does success look like in scaling some of these agent networks? Um, I know, for example, in Nigeria, you have organizations that have 20, 30, maybe 40,000 agents, but sometimes we start to see a ceiling there. Um, what is your viewpoint on scale within that, that part of that segment of the sector? So, I mean, arguably people say we need about 500,000 agents to, to, to cut it in Nigeria. So organizations like SANEF, which is another potential area of partnership that was led by regulators and led by, right, by, led by the banks. SANEF was created to make it possible for people to share agents because the, the, the past reality was that every infrastructure, every network, every player would go and build their own agent network. And in some cases, those agents become duplicates because one agent can be serving three people um, that have three different devices. So SANEF came in and the objective of SANEF was to make it possible that every super agent out there and every agent out there could potentially be shared. As at the last count, so SANEF is less than two years old, but as the last count, their target for this year was to get to 250,000 agents and they've already, they've already beat 250,000 agents for this year. Um, they're edging towards 300,000. So although we are still short of our entire goal of 500,000, that you can see where they are, they are actually working hard towards, towards getting there. Now, there are still um, opportunity for it to even grow. So we have new licenses that have been issued recently called the PSB license. And hopefully this payment service banks brought in two telcos to, this, to the game. And potentially these two telcos will actually help to even move this to, I mean, closer to the goal that wants to be achieved from a financial inclusion perspective. Great. Thank you so much, Charles. Uh, Shabani, maybe you can reference how you're working with partners and what that experience has been like for you in this region. Sure. Um, and actually, I feel pretty lucky. We're partnering with Charles's organization, uh, InterSwitch in Kenya. Uh, we've talked to GB about working together across the region. And so um, I would say that I definitely agree. I mean, it is all about kind of how can we create the most flexible options for our customers so that again, we're meeting them where they already are. Um, and so both Charles and GB are, you know, really helping to develop that infrastructure across the region. Um, the other thing I would say is actually thinking again about that piece around um, kind of the emotional side of money, as well as kind of developing customers trust. And so outside of infrastructure, and this kind of gets back to it, but we think about it as, you know, um, can we partner with uh, kind of places that are bringing money into the system? Um, so when I think of that, I really think of, again, remittances, and we think of continuity of money. And so we want to think of how can we help our customers access yesterday's money, today's money, as well as tomorrow's money. Um, so it's not necessarily about a credit product, an insurance product, a savings product in the kind of definition that we think of it as. And it's much more about that fluidity. And so if we become able to show them that, you know, these different flows of capital can be accessed through Tala and can then be dispersed to them through these different payment networks. Um, that is kind of how you, again, kind of develop that trust. And so that's how we think about it is both the infrastructure side, 
but again, the mental models and how can we partner with folks that are again, already sort of in that money flow with our customers. Great, thank you. And GB, what are some examples of successful partnerships and, and what does that look like in your case, building out infrastructure across the region? So the approach we've always taken is Africa does not exist in isolation, right? We have to make sure we connect all the corridors to Africa and make things easy. Africa is a continent where most things are imported, right? So we have to ensure that if we're providing payment systems, it has to be beyond Africa. So the corridors that are big for us are China to Africa, the US to Africa, the UK to Africa, EU to Africa. And in China, in 2018, we partnered with Ali, Ali, Ali and Financial, and we integrated Ali Pay into Flutterwave so that Chinese payers can use Flutterwave to pay or get paid through our platform. Um, same as what we're doing, something similar we discover as well in the US for asset discover cards. We have a mix already on our platform. And the goal of this is to not just stay and say, hey, we can do African payments, right? We want to be able to do all kinds of payments. We have direct Visa and MasterCard integrations because of that reason. So we can be able to make it simple for payments to be easy for people across the continent. And we've seen impact of that. You have the likes of schools like MIT, when they are collecting payment from African students, they use FlutterWave. You have uh, like TransferWise and FlutterWave to connect to Africa to do payout. So the goal here is just to not just be an African player, rather be an emerging market focused player and connect the, the African you know networks to each other. And next step for us is, is basically how do we connect Canada to Africa, connect, um, you know, make it seamless, make it simple, make payments real time, right? Make it simple so that a, a Canadian user can send money into Africa real time through FlutterWave or to any of our partners. And that's the goal, really. So we're big on partnership of FlutterWave, yes. Great. Anybody want to talk about failed partnerships? Because because sometimes it, it's not easy. <laughs> I don't want to put anybody on the spot and you don't have to mention any names, but curious if you have any kind of experiences where partnership just did not work or um, it, it was frustrating and, and challenging. Let, let me take a stab at <laughs> So, I mean, I mean, we, because Part of our growth strategy is to partner up, right? We've had some some scenarios where it didn't work out, right? But it typically is because of maybe the priority of the partner shifted before we could conclude, right? Or the market dynamics changed, right? Not necessarily because the partners did not have good intention to partner with us and vice versa. So we've seen where you started a partnership due to a market demand. For example, COVID happened, for example, right? Everybody had to just old of till you know COVID is over. So such scenarios basically create such um on hell on comfortable partnership stories. But uh, yeah. but they are always we always leave them in the place wherever we can pick it up in the future. That's that's what I've seen so far. Yeah. Always keeping the door open. You never know how things will evolve. I just want to um, actually just direct one question to Charles specifically, because we've been talking a lot about infrastructure. It's probably come up five or six times already. And in the African context, banks and telco uh, providers are important. And I'd love to hear more from you on why this has been the case um, and how you see those players operating and accentuating digital financial services? Um, are they still extremely relevant or are fintech operators excelling and, and pushing beyond where those players can operate? Okay, thank, thanks for that question. Uh, I'll start by saying that I'll, the main reason why banks and telcos, I think they are going to be relevant for a while to come in the African context is that they are probably the most trusted entities in, 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 the, in on the continent. If a startup wants to be successful in delivering a consumer-based product, I would always recommend go and partner with a bank or a telco because the banks already have whole people's money. So, I mean, the only things people don't like banks and telcos for are the fees and charges. But apart from that, the likelihood that you get your money back if you put your money in there is higher than if you put your money in a startup business that is providing an alternative service. So I expect banks and telcos to always to always be extremely, extremely relevant. So they they already have the critical mass to reach people. So if the, the reason why M-Pesa is successful in Kenya was right from the very beginning, 
Safaricom had 70% market share of consumers. So imagine with 70% market share of access to the devices in people's hands, you now create a product, automatically 70% of people in the country already have access to that. Then you have a bank also in Kenya called Equity Bank that started off as a um, home finance credit union, and it's a company that is probably the most loved bank in Africa. I mean, I'm not advertising for them, but it's probably the most loved bank in Africa. So imagine them introducing a new service or a new product, you would trust them first before trusting a product that comes from, from a startup. So uh, my recommendation will always be, if possible, if a fintech or a startup is creating a new product that is financial related, find some kind of partnership with a dominant or a listening bank that already has lots of customers. And that will be the best place to trial your product because because of that underlying trust that they already have, creating something new and trying it with them, they can more easily be forgiven that, okay, this is a one-off error versus you come in and you really have no opportunity to go back to the customer if your product fails. So that I think they would remain extremely relevant and they have a lot of money also. <laughs> <laughs> and they have a lot of money also. So those I'll, I'll so say they that have they, the ear, they have the hearts of the clients and they're a great partner to work with in order to get your financial service I, out there. No, I didn't say they're a great partner. <laughs> <laughs> I said true, I said true. if you can find one, yeah, they are they are they are a good partner to have if because that's they are the easiest way to get to markets. Sometimes yeah. they can be extremely demanding because of the power that they that they control. So you create a product. I mean, it's it's same with market power everywhere, whether it's I mean, Amazon, anyone you partner with, whether it's Walmart, if they have market power, they have to dictate a lot of things to to you. And you, I mean, most times it may be fair. Sometimes it may not be fair. But um, as a startup or as a fintech player that wants to get into the market, you have to find a way to, to balance, uh, balance that out. Well, thank you for that perspective, Charles. I appreciate it. And I wanted to enter into the, I, I feel like you can't enter into a room, even a digital room without bringing up COVID. And uh, GB, you brought it up. So now we have to talk about it. Um, I'm very curious for the entire panel. Uh, the reality is COVID has impacted our region. Um, we haven't We've, we've seen devastation, especially when it comes to household incomes dropping, um, economic kind of frustration in certain countries. But I want to really um, dive into where you're seeing the opportunity now. Um, the reality is, is it has ushered in this digital acceptance probably and, and kind of thrust people into a position where they didn't anticipate being. So I'd, I'd be curious to hear how that has impacted your business and where you're really looking to capitalize on this opportunity. Yeah, so I mean, we we had high hopes for 2020 in December last year, last year. You know, we all pumped up thinking, well, it's gonna be a great year. It's still gonna be a great year, to be honest, <laughs> right? But what we, what we saw in February when COVID became a big deal was, I mean, we had to one, we had to go remote the entire company. Uh, we all went remote, and good things were still remote thanks to COVID. Um, but we also saw a massive disruption to our client business because, I mean, we're a payment company. We can only process what our customers can, you know, accept from the airline space where we had a lot of clients to hotel to schools. You know, we're just one sector after the other going down week by week. Mm -hmm. And um, we basically just pivoted and focused on what we called COVID beneficiaries, right? Which like the e-commerce, gaming and remittances, right? We just moved to those sectors, focused on those sectors exclusively throughout the period. And the interesting thing is we also saw an opportunity because a lot of the African small businesses are to close because of COVID and they were not selling. So we built a Shopify for Africa platform, right, in COVID, right? We built that platform, you know, remotely and we launched it in, I think, in May. And, we, and since then to now, we've got over... 10,000 SMEs sign up to use our platform to sell, to create a free e-commerce shop with payment and delivery integrated to sell to their customers. That was a very big um, surprise to us then. So we grew basically um, compared to last year, you know, we grew you know, month on month compared to last year despite COVID. And that's because of that readjustment and pivot into where we think we can get the value, value from. But the beautiful thing is now COVID is, at least in Africa, right? It's been amazing. 
the way the African government have been able to put in measures in place to, you know, to make ensure that the COVID um, break, break, break how isn't as pronounced as everywhere else in the world. It's been really great. And, you know, so the economy is coming back. You know, we have the travel segment slowly coming back. You know, it might take a while, but yeah, it's happening gradually. The schools are, are not open yet, but they're about to be open. So we're seeing things, you know, gradually going back to some semblance of normalcy, right? But yeah, it's it really was huge for us as well, for the way we saw, I mean, our customers, we had to just basically be there for them, like, hey, we're here, and, you know, partner with the likes of Visa and Mastercard to offer discount to customers who want to shop during COVID, you know, basically built an, an e-commerce infrastructure from the ground up, you know, during the period to serve African SMEs who, can, who were not online before, now they are online. The value here we've seen is there's been a massive acceleration of digital um, payment in, in COVID, right? e come went to an all-time high, you know, and it's really amaz amazing. It's the same thing everywhere, right? COVID has really helped people to see that, hey, yes, you don't need to, you don't need to go open that shop anymore. You can actually run it online and you can still get the same sales. You can get the same service and you can even go global. You can go beyond just selling to people in your neighborhood, right? And that's really been a great discovery for us as we launch the Follow Wave store in the last couple of months. So, I mean, it's it's been it's been good and bad because good because now we know that yes, we can be remote for the for the for like six months and counting, and we are enjoying that. Bad because our customers were affected, but overall, I think there's a lot of lessons to take away from this um, experience, which we're trying to channel into our into our daily lives now. Follow Wave. That's a great perspective, GB. Thank you. So showing that there are going to be more entrepreneurs online selling their, their services and being able to expand across borders quite quite um, clearly. Now, I know from a lending pers uh, perspective, COVID might have been different. If I look at my uh, lending companies that we've invested in, there's been a pretty beautiful U-shaped curve in a sense. Um, so Shivani, would love to hear from you kind of how you guys have weathered through COVID and maybe the opportunity that you see on the other side of it, whether that's from a product perspective, whether that's from a market perspective, um, or even just a resiliency perspective. Yeah, I love that last uh, point around resiliency. Um, and so actually, I mean, I think maybe something that's a little different for us than the Flutterwave customer is that our customer is, you know, kind of, I think, um, probably one to two steps below that customer in terms of you know access to capital and access to traditional financial products and so we're very much focused on you know i would say the sole proprietor versus sme um, and so this is kind of a vegetable seller this is someone running a business out of their home things like that and um i think that resiliency point though is the most interesting because you know, even before COVID, our customers had very volatile lives. <laughs> um, and so there was a lot that we could actually learn from our customers during this time. You know, um, yes, COVID definitely hit them. But in some ways, you know, um, I would say that this piece around um, is, the, is the person actually selling, you know, kind of their goods out of their home or on the street, those kinds of things. There was still business being done. Um, and so in some ways, what we needed to do was be able to really use the kind of data that we have and, again, talk to our customers. And so rather than, again, enforcing payment plans right now, we kind of said, let's create the most, again, flexible payment plans we can for our customers. But let's actually get on the phone, do things that don't scale initially, right? So when the crisis first hit, yes, we tried to control for risk. But the second thing that we did immediately was really think about how can we use this as an opportunity to really develop a relationship with the customer um, and learn from them. And our customers actually, again, told us that they had the capital to pay back our, our um, lending products to us. And so, yeah, we saw a dip, um, but actually it wasn't as pronounced as we expected. Um, and as the markets have now started to reopen again across all countries, we're actually starting to see that in some places, we're actually um, seeing higher repayment rates than we did pre-COVID. Um, and I really do kind of attribute that again to, at this point, the customer has to uh, prioritize, right? So they're really having to think about what brands, what products are giving me the most value? Um, who's gonna be there for me in the time of a crisis? And so 
that's again, how do you get to being top of wallet or top of mind for your customer? Um, and I think, you know, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, you were saying something earlier about, you know, why other products during this time potentially haven't come up. And I really, again, think of it as in a time of crisis, at the end of the day, you have to be able to fulfill that instant value proposition. And so even though we know things like insurance, P2P, those things are helpful to an individual, um, it's hard to start thinking about tomorrow when you're really in the moment. And so it is really, again, that flow of money um, in the day-to-day -day life. I love that point, Shivani, on this um, concept of like, are you going to be top of mind for a, a client and, and are you going to make the cut as a business, right? When, when, a, when a client is cutting and, and deciding who they want to have stay in their lives, um, are you going to be at the top of that list? And I'm curious, do you think that that's going to result in um, more early stage ventures or even just digital ventures kind of withering out and dying and we're going to have these larger players there? Or do you still see um, there being an opportunity for, for the amount of players that we have today. Yeah, um, so at Tala, we we have like a anecdote internally around, um, you know, there was a movie, Forrest Gump, and he talks about being the last shrimp, last shrimp boat standing, right? And so it is definitely what you're saying, which is we couldn't take one approach, right? We couldn't just look at the long-term view and say, we wanna develop a relationship and double down on brand during COVID. We had to really say, first, you have to be able to protect your business, your team, make sure that you can actually withstand the storm. And then at the same time, start to think about what opportunities there are. Think about how you can actually be there for your customers. So I definitely think it's twofold. Um, and so as a startup, it's definitely hard when you're just starting out. You may not have as much of that capital, um, but it's kind of you know battling down the hatches and, and thinking about what else you can do to reduce your risk um, as you think about opportunities. Thank you for that. Now, I realize we only have about 60 seconds left. So, um, and that means that you guys have escaped having to talk about regulation in Africa. <laughs> so we're gonna, we're gonna end on an upbeat note. Um, and I would love to hear from each of you, kind of what is the, the thing that you see over the next decade kind of seeing Africa emerge out of this situation? What are you most excited to see happen? And what is your prediction for the region and even maybe for your own business? Charles, maybe we could start with you. Uh, all right. So one of the good things that has come out of COVID is that businesses that had prior to this time been scared of doing anything online, including vendor payments or receiving payments online, are now embracing that because that's really the only option that they have. And in, in, in our markets, I, I expect to see things like USSD, which is not, I mean, is not in the US at all. USSD continuously continue to scale and continue to grow in the, in the African market. Now QR payments, which is well known in, in Asia, I expect it to also start to grow because it is also um, contactless. Now you, in COVID times, people, um, basically keeping away from cash, keeping away from point of sale terminals and almost keeping away from ATMs. So mobile services and those kinds of services. And and, in, and lastly, I would also think, um, talk about social media payments. I expect commerce on social media platforms to become a mainstay as well because people, when they are locked down or staying at home, spend a lot more time on social media. So how do we make sure that that is also a channel through which they can enjoy fintech services. So that's what I see as the not too distant future in the African continent. Great. GB, how about you? What is your prediction for the future and what are you excited about next 10 years in Africa? Yeah, I, 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 for me, it's really, you know, showing the entire world that yes, Africa can build global payment companies from, from Africa. That's very important. We've seen it done with InterSwitch, um, even though I, I'm not sure there is enough recognition of the work people like Charles have done on the continent. And, uh, you know, so that for us is very important to people to say that, yes, it's possible. Um, people like us are building based on that foundation. And we also want to, you know, take our copies to a level whereby the entire world knows, yes, how we can build global emerging payment companies from Africa. Yeah, that's my uh, thing. Thank you. And Shivani, final words. Um, maybe I'll go a different direction and say, in addition to the infrastructure side, um, I think one of the opportunities that's come out of COVID is actually on the regulatory side. I think governments are realizing 
that digital infrastructure, payment infrastructure, national ID systems are extremely important uh, to be able to reach their citizens during times of crisis. And so uh, I think, you know, I think we will see over the next 10 years, um, really governments having to evolve uh, to think about financial inclusion um, as they think about kind of the uh, regulatory markets. Great. Well, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Charles, Shivani, and GB for sharing all of their insights. Today, we learned about the state of infrastructure payments and lending infrastructure in the region. We heard about um, why financial literacy is on the rise and what that means for consumers and adopting new products. We are also hearing that um, mobile payment acceptance is going to be on the rise, whether it's USSD, QR codes, um, shopping through through um, online shops and, and Instagram, um, and that we shouldn't give up on governments, banking partners, and telcos. They are still very relevant. <laughs> we have to interact with them, and, and they are going to be those partners that, that we need to um, really leverage in order to scale some of these solutions. So thank you so much for your time today um, and giving the audience some perspective on what's happening across the Africa region and hopefully we will see you again on stage next year all right thank you thank you so much thank you so much